It's nice to be with you, Professor Martin, here. Hi, Tiago. It's nice to be here in Brazil. <laughs> it's amazing because we have so many patients that want to go to surgery, want to underwrite surgery, and feel sometimes unsafe to go to surgery. Because most of the patients here in Brazil uh, believe that sinusitis doesn't have a cure, that has a treatment, and you have to deal with it until the rest of the life. So, usually you have this kind of problem with your patients in Canada. It Really, this depends upon patient education. One of the biggest problems with chronic sinusitis with nasal polyposis is that you don't have much uh, disease state awareness in the general population. What that means is nobody really knows about this disease unless they have it or they have a family member that's affected by it. And even the pulmonologists managing asthmatics were often not familiar that their patients had nasal polyps. So this is basically one of the problems is the recognition and the education that goes along with this. The education is the message that we give and up until very recently, the only way to manage polyposis has been with surgery. And surgery is very effective, even if it can be temporary. For many patients, you have to understand that surgery has been a life changer, that they get prolonged benefits, and 70% of patients who have nasal polyposis will derive a benefit and not require a revision. What we're discussing here are the group that do need a revision. So what that means is, in expert hands, even well done, some cases will fail. For the moment, we don't know exactly which these cases are. We suspect we have some markers, AERD, potentially even asthma. One great marker, however, is previous surgery. And patients who have undergone previous surgery have three in four chances of recurring. So for a patient who's already gone surgery, I'd agree with you. Up until very recently, their only choice, even with excellent medical management, has been to undergo repeated surgical procedures. And eventually, often this leads to a complication or to uh, some long-term damage, potentially to their sense of smell. So this leads us to wonder whether this was the best way and whether we may not be better off exploring other options. Actually, you know better the natural history of nasal polyps. So when you face a patient that has small polyps, and for example, a grade two polyps in the middle meatus, that was feeling good with nasal spray, you, you are intended to talk with him to do the surgery? No. No, no. You manage chronic sinusitis with nasal polyposis in a stepwise fashion. And often our vision of disease is skewed by the fact that the patients we see are in an advanced stage, particularly in academic centers. But the reality of everyday practice is that there's a good deal of nasal polyposis which will respond to a simple nasal corticosteroid. And if a simple nasal corticosteroid has never been tried, it has to be tried. I personally would have liked that the general practitioner or the colleague that sends them to me have tried this, but if it hasn't been tried, I will try that. Now, often I will combine this with a burst of oral corticosteroids. This is in order to, I guess I'm impatient, it's in order to speed up the treatment. And what I'd like to see is, will these polyps respond to corticosteroid therapy eventually? And would these patients be, um, will they do well? So essentially what I do is a trial of therapy. The patient will get oral steroids for a five or 10 day period at a low dosage, no more than 30 milligrams per day. And then I will administer uh, a topical corticosteroid at the same time. And then the patient is seen 60 weeks later to see their response. Either you see a prolonged response that lasts in a happy patient, or you see uh, initial improvement and a recurrence of polyposis. And even if you have a recurrence of polyposis at this stage, then you can uh, monitor whether the corticosteroid restored the sense of smell, giving you an idea how you're going to counsel the patient long term on their sense of smell. Can it be returned even with surgery? Or is there a sense of smell underneath all those polyps? I saw you talking about a, a new approach for the sinus. I think it's amazing to preserve 
the superior terminate. But I was thinking about if we can have a problem of circulation with this kind of approach. Well, since I don't believe in recirculation, this isn't really uh, a concern in this case, but clearly it's going to demand uh, technical skills, which are equal to what you should be applying to ethmoidectomy. Um, with the, this does not leave a synechia, but again, uh, just like the ethmoidectomy, just like the frontal sinusotomy, this does not have to be, this has to not be a timid surgical procedure where you poke holes in the bone and hope this lets the drug in, but rather you remove all of the lamella in order to allow wound healing to occur. Think back to surgery and your first days as an intern. What heals better? A nice clean cut which heals by primary intention or something which heals erratically with granulation tissue? I think we all know that you want a primary closure. So I don't see why we lose our surgical principles when we enter the nose. We know all your research about probiotics and probionase and races. And how is it working out right now? Well, I would suggest that the experience overall is very positive. It's certainly proved to be safe, which was the big concern regarding a probiotic. In eight years of sales now, there have been no issues of ear infections, sinus infections, throat infections, or any systemic infections of source. Of course, it's not recommended like any probiotic for use in an immune deficient population. However, in the chronic sinusitis population, which is quite diseased, it's done fine. Now the question comes up, with every microbiome agent is disrupt, are you able to disrupt a chronically disturbed microbiome in chronic disease with medication? And increasingly, it's looking more and more difficult. While most chronic inflammatory diseases have a microbiome that is uh, different from what it would be and that they can show that these microbiome metabolites contribute to disease by traveling systemically to the brain or to other parts, it's uh, very difficult to get rid of these. So when we take the success of the stool transplant, which is given to people with an acute Clostridium difficile infection, and then try to, for example, cure Crohn's disease with probiotics, it doesn't work. And my mistake is that we, um, we thought that we could change the sinus microbiome by adding probiotics. And that's probably not correct as such. So taking a note from uh, acute colitis, probably the best interventions with probiotics are for acute disease, seasonal rhinitis, uh, and particularly something I'm very interested as a immune booster for viral infections in the early phase. And this would probably play a much greater role. For patients with chronic allergies, it turns out that probiotic treatment in the nose is fantastic. This wasn't an application that we've researched, and this is something we'd like to move into. But nevertheless, I think that probiotics for chronic sinusitis is very much a medium. It's a complement to existing therapy. But in other milder diseases, viral diseases, allergic rhinitis, it may prove to be monotherapy and effective all on its own. I talk about your paper these days because I read another paper where the patients that had Staphylococcus aureus in the mucosa had yeah. worse to not 22 results after biologics. Yeah. So I was thinking about if perhaps in the future you can combine them, not only change the microbiome, but change dealing with the biologics also. It's... Uh... I, I like that idea because the idea would be that um, probiotics will essentially enhance what, what is there and encourage the development of a normal flora and that if you combine it with a more effective agent, surgery, biologic, something more pro potent, this may play a role. And I, I haven't uh, used it in an early post-operative population to see if we could colonize them with a better bug. And, improve the growth of a, of a uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And again, that's very exciting. Probably the epithelium could not rule the world, but we are facing off the fact, with the fact that the epithelium will rule the nose. Ep well, epithelium <laughs> rules the nose. And what's interesting in it is in every experiment that we profile with uh, transcriptomic techniques, 
be it endoscopic sinus surgery, be it treatment with azithromycin, be it treatment with intranasal probiotics, or now as we show even with treatment with dupilumab, or as other authors show with uh, mepolizumab, every case of success is associated with epithelial resolution. So it looks like there's a great many ways to be sick, but there is only one target for health. So there's only one way to be well. It's to have an intact epithelium that's not aggressed by a dysfunctional immune system. And in that case, you will have a healthy microbiome. That's the problem. The microbiome is a reflection of the underlying status. So it can't be changed that much. And increasingly, as we think about, well, something must be causing disease. I certainly would blame a microbe, but I don't think that a bacteria initiates disease. I think that it simply takes advantage of a diseased situation. And when we look at patients recovering from endoscopic sinus surgery, what we see is the first sign of dysfunction is edema and secretions. It's not bacterial infection. Then, once the mucosa is dysfunctional, the pathogenic bacteria attach themselves to this and cause the crusting. And then, of course, potentiate what is already a bad situation. But to reverse this, you take the example from trichaphna and cystic fibrosis. What you want to do is rehabilitate the epithelium. And what we see in cystic fibrosis, which for me represents my biggest challenge in sinus surgery, is that when you treat the epithelium with trichaphta, the disease simply disappears and the bad bacteria go away. So this is a concrete proof that it's epithelial rehabilitation that leads to success. And I think we've really latched onto something new here. Just a final question. Every time we deal with daily problems, and sometimes that daily problems bring some insights to research. Do you have any, any history you can share with us of any daily problems that you face in AA? This could help me to solve this problem in the bench. Uh, it's the thing that has mostly driven my research is from the beginning of my career when patients began recurring with disease. And it was very frustrating because at that time I blamed it all on myself and I took it personally. And I set out to improve on this. And this, this quest, which 30 years later, is still the same quest to improve the results. I would like every sinus operation to turn out perfectly. And we're still, we're still working on that, but the future looks ever closer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank, Thank you, you, Tiago. Have a nice day.